Good morning. We're happy to see all of you here. Beautiful Lord's Day morning. We're grateful for the opportunity to come together to, for Bible class hour. It's 10 o'clock, uh, 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock's worship hour. <laughs> but uh, here we are at 9 a.m. for our uh, Bible class hour. We're so happy that uh, you are here and uh, with us today. Um, I believe our, our numbers, we, we, it might be quiet at Wood Avenue today. We have a lot of people. I'm not sure how many, but we have a lot of people at Collinsville. So I never did get a count of how many are over there, but uh, I know a lot of the uh, college students, those who work with them are there, the high school students, and those who work with them are there, and others, and some going just for the weekend and coming back. Uh, we'll be going. Uh, We'll be going first thing in the morning, Ashley, kids and myself. We're going to help them Monday and Tuesday, and we'll be back for Wednesday night summer series. So certainly appreciate uh, your prayers and everyone who is traveling there and back. Um, we're grateful uh, the second year now to be able to take our VBS to them, help out the smaller congregation, I think about 30 members. Uh, so uh, able to help with that and try to kind of get them uh, pointing in the right direction. They've seen the numbers go down some over the years and so it's more than just VBS um, trying to help them in, uh, in areas of evangelism and and so that's what we'll be doing during today uh, tomorrow and helping in those efforts so we certainly appreciate your prayers for the work in Collinsville this week and all that uh, trying to accomplish there and the travels there and back and uh, as I mentioned that might uh, affect our numbers today but uh, we are thankful that you are here I'm grateful for the opportunity to study the Word of God. We will wrap up John this morning uh, and possibly, most likely, we'll get into Philip. So if you did not get the handouts on Philip, uh, you're welcome to do so. Uh, they're out on the tables. And uh, you're welcome to get a handout if you would like to do so on the Apostle uh, Philip. But before we get into our class, we will have our prayer. Are there any specific questions uh, prayer request this this morning. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Charles. We'll pray for the lost and pray for those in Ukraine as well. Thank you so much for reminding us, Charles. Any other prayer requests? It was good to see J.D. here with us Wednesday night. Certainly still needs our prayers and uh, uh, long road ahead. Decisions still to be made things that are somewhat out of his control from years past, but um, certainly want to continue to pray for him and encourage him. It's good to see him here Wednesday night. Okay, let's, uh, let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your blessings. We're thankful for the opportunity to be here today to study your word grateful, Father, for all who are here, for all of our teachers, each one who's come together to, to be a part of Bible class. We're grateful, Father, for our elders, our ministers, our deacons, for each one who labors here, and works being done that we know about, and many that we do not know about. As, as, as your children that meet in this location go about daily life and living the example of Christ, we're so grateful, Father, for congregation that meets here and we pray that we'll always be faithful to you and glorify you according to your word. We pray that we'll do all things with one another and in this community and throughout the world with love and unity based upon your word. Father, we uh, pray for those in Collinsville. We're grateful for the work that they're able to do. We're grateful for this congregation supporting it and we ask your blessings as we try to help a sister congregation and uh, we, we pray that we can do it in the right way. And um, we pray that uh, those who will travel there and back will be safe as they do so. Heavenly Father, we pray for our brother J.D. We're so grateful to have been able to see him Wednesday night. We pray your blessings will be upon him and upon the, the days ahead. Help him to be faithful. Help him to, to endure in his faithfulness and to, to glorify you in all that he does. Father, we pray for the lost, those who are seeking truth especially. Help your children to find them find a way to find you. We pray for the Ukraine and uh, the continued uh, news and heartache that we hear from this area on, on both sides. We know that uh, so many who would, on both sides would not want this to happen. 
yet they're placed in you. They are affected and their families are affected. We pray, Father, that there could be an end to all of this and that there could be peaceful days ahead in these nations and nations of the world. Father, bless us as we study. We thank you for the apostles. We thank you for what you have told us about them in the Bible. Uh, we pray that uh, we will always learn from them and uh, learn the areas of to imitate and the areas to learn from to avoid. Help us as we study together today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I mentioned, we're, um, we're on the last uh, point of John's life. If you have your outline, um, I did not leave any out there from last week, but uh, if you need the handout on John or any of the other handouts on the apostles, uh, I'll be happy to provide them uh, for you, and uh, but what is on the tables that of Philip, and we will begin looking at uh, Philip a little, a little uh, later, perhaps uh, this morning. So John remained faithful. John remained faithful. That's where we are. We're talking about the Apostle John. We're talking about the brother of James. We're talking. Uh, about the fishermen. We're talking about the son of Zebedee. We're, we're, we're talking about the one who was a partner with Peter and, uh, and uh, his brother Andrew. So this is the one that we're talking about. This is the one that we, uh, we discussed uh, over the last couple of weeks. And today we're ready to wrap up his life with he uh, remaining faithful to God. John's life was one that had plenty of trouble and uh, heartache in it. And that was true for all the apostles. And um, that, uh, that's true for most. And that's true for most people. It seems as if some uh, might have uh, more than others. Uh, might have to endure more than others in this lifetime. Uh, and sometimes it's our mindset. And when things happen and uh, our, you know, our approach to it before they happen. And how we... Uh, how we manage through the unexpected in life and the tragedies uh, in life. Um, John's life is one that had plenty of trouble and heartache in it. In the early days of the church, he was arrested and beaten. Open uh, to your Bible to Acts chapter 4 and uh, verse 1. Acts chapter 4 and verse 1. Remember... Uh, the church begins in Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem, the day of Pentecost. They're in Jerusalem. They remain in Jerusalem uh, up until chapter 7, the end of chapter 7. Uh, in chapter 3, you find Peter and John healing this lame man uh, at the temple. Uh, we discussed that last week in Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them being greatly disturbed and they taught the people and pre that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So remember uh, after this man is healed in the first uh, 10 verses in verse 11 this is when Peter and John take advantage of an opportunity to teach others. So in verse 3 they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. So we see John's life in the early days of the church, when I mean, you're measuring the church by days at this point in time, in the early days of the church, John and Peter are arrested and uh, they're put into custody, custody uh, until the, the next day. And what we're going to notice is how this, uh, this doesn't stop. It continues on for them. So if really you would want to read all of chapters 3, 4, and 5, but notice... Um, down in verse 21, verse 21 of Acts chapter 4. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. So for the teaching of Christ, uh, the resurrection, remember it's the Sadducees, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Paul used that to his advantage later in the book of Acts in, uh, in, in turning the Sadducees and Pharisees against one another. 
Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, so when they taught the resurrection, this really uh, hit a nerve with the Sadducees. And we see that uh, they were arrested, but they were only arrested. Now, we say that as only arrested. I mean, most of us would not uh, want this to happen to us. But as we get into chapter 5, we're going to see that it, they, they then take the next step. And that's what happens. They'll continue to take the next step, and then the next, and then the next, trying to do all they can to stop uh, this. And eventually, uh, the death of James, the brother of John, in Acts chapter 12. So if you drop into five, chapter 5, verse 17, beginning... You know, the first few verses are that of um, Ananias and uh, Sapphira. But in Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and laid hands on the apostles and put them in common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. The high priest and those who came and called uh, the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So now here for a second time, you see it just says the apostles. No doubt that's going to include uh, Peter uh, and John uh, being arrested. Uh, thrown into a common prison, but the Lord, through a miracle, releases them, tells them, go back and teach. Go back and teach. And by the way, we looked a little bit last week at um, uh, some of their going in and out of prison and some of their prayers. You know, they were praying for strength to continue to be faithful. Um, and, and that's something important that we realize and understand that even in these circumstances, they were praying that they would continue to, to be faithful to God. If you drop down to verse 27 of chapter 5, Acts chapter 5 and verse 27. So they find them out teaching in the temple as God had commanded them. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you to not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine." and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Now, I didn't put this in your notes, and I can't recall where it is off the top of my head, but isn't it interesting that when Jesus was being crucified, um, when they were hollering, crucify him, crucify him, they said, let his blood be on us. <laughs> but now the tables have turned a little bit, and these leaders are saying, you're trying to bring this man's blood on us. And that's when Peter spoke up in verse 29, and the other apostles said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Drop down to verse 33. When they had heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. So you see, chapter 4, they're arrested. They let them go the next day. Uh, chapter 5. Now, um, they're arrested again. They're, they're angry. They're thinking, we just need to kill these people. We need to, we need to get rid of them. Chapter 5, verse 40, beginning. And they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So you, again, a man who life is ups and downs, plenty of trouble, plenty of heartache, uh, that uh, he was uh, dealing with uh, in chapters 4 and 5, the arrest, the beatings, the, the commands to not go out and teach in the name of Jesus, but they're obeying God, and they're just continuing to go out and to obey God and to preach, uh, preach in this name. So did I see... That's right, yeah. At this point in time, that's right. That's right. Yeah, the Sadducees, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Um, and, um, yeah, they're, they're really pushing this. And uh, you're, you're right. This, uh, this, this great uh, teacher, Gamaliel, he, you know, his words are certainly worth reading uh, in uh, verse 33 forward. And he says, you know, basically, look, if this is of God, we can't overthrow it. 
You can try all you want to. If this is not, then it'll come to pass. But if this is of God, you can't overthrow it. And they couldn't then and it can't be done now. Oh, that's right. That's right. You know, people then and still people today are, are, were looking for signs, are looking for signs. They think that's where it's out. But if you do a study of the Bible, and in particular in the book of Acts, you see clearly where they were just to uh, confirm that the message was the word of God. When you get into Acts chapter 10, uh, God used a sign to confirm to his apostle that um, Gentiles could be saved. And uh, so that, that's what they were for. The power's in the Word of God, Acts chapter 11 and verse 14. And that's so important that we realize that and understand that. People who are, are, are looking for a sign will always look for the next and the next and the next. This is, uh, this is true. And then on the other hand, sometimes those, uh, those uh, make-believe signs come up. You know, we think we see something. I had a, um, an instructor once... Uh, in uh, uh, psych psychology instructor, and I mean, I'll never forget. He said, "Do you ever you ever driving down the road at night and you see mailbox people?" And what is it? Um, not 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 yeah, mailbox people. That's what he called them. And he said, "Well, you look down the road and you know your mind has the ability to try to fill in the gaps, and you see something that's dark, and you think it's a person standing there, but then you get closer, and it's just a mailbox. Well, your mind is, you know, trying to piece together what you're seeing without all the information and." A lot of times you'll see something that's not really there. You get closer and you realize it's a mailbox. So sometimes we do that to ourselves. You know, we'll, we'll see stuff that we think, you know, we see, but we actually don't. And, um, but, yeah, even in the time when these signs were real, not everybody was believing them. I mean, you look at uh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians in the book of Exodus and the plagues. It's easy for us to read that and say, I would have totally turned to God. No, you wouldn't. If, if you're not believing and obeying God because of his word, then you're not going to believe him and obey him because of signs. Sure. Right. The, the, the rich man in Luke 16, 19 through 31, he says, send Lazarus back that he might go to our brothers. Abraham says, hey, they, no, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. You know, so, yeah, absolutely. Good point. Anything else? Okay, uh, notice uh, next, uh, his brother James became the first apostle to die when he was murdered by wicked Herod in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We talked about that when we talked about the apostle James, and that's when um, you find Herod killing him by the sword, uh, Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, no doubt this would have been uh, beheading him, the brother of John, with the sword. So what, what I'm pointing out here is look, look, look at John's heartache in, in the early days of the church. Prison. Prison again. Beaten. His brother is, 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 is the first apostle to die, the first martyr. He's executed by Herod. I mean, this is a lot to go through. He, Jesus, the crucifixion. We, never, we haven't even discussed that yet. And in, in his own personal life and the, the things that he had, he, he still had a personal life. He still had his day-to-day -to, -day to take care of. I think that's important for us to remember. You know, Peter was married with children. Likely John was as well. Um, I mean, they, they still had day-to-day -day business to take care of. And he also was the one who was responsible for taking care of Mary, our, the Lord, our Lord's mother, you know. I mean, there's just all of this is going on in this man's life. And, and it's just all coming down on him. But he's faithful. Again, I'm, I'm going to say it again. You'll probably hear it every week. You, you have to see how their faith grows, how their faith is developing, how they're becoming stronger. In each passing chapter, they're becoming stronger. And that's what God wants. He wants of us. He wants us to continue in his word, to continue in prayer, to continue in worship, to continue spending time with the saints, to continue working in the Lord's kingdom. And all of this is going to result in your faith growing, your faith developing uh, into the person that God wants you to be. So, you know, we've already read enough to say most, maybe not most, but some people would have given up. Some people would have turned away from Christianity. Some people would have said, no more, I'm not. 
I'm not doing this anymore. But John didn't, and the other apostles did not. Um, he lived long enough to see Jerusalem and the temple destroyed. <clears throat> you know, it's uh, certainly believed. Uh, that the Bible does not uh, tell us um, about his death. A lot of historical uh, records would tell us, you know, that he lived to an old age, perhaps uh, the end of the first century, most likely the end of the first century. You know, the temple, Jerusalem being destroyed in, um, in AD 70. Brian talked a little bit about that Wednesday night when he covered uh, Matthew chapter 24. I mean, he lived through that. He lived through that. And he was faithful to God, living through that. Um, you know, imagine if, the, if I mean, the, the, the best picture I can paint is if this were in your lifetime and, and your hometown is destroyed and everything you know about your hometown is destroyed. I mean, this is John's life. This is what John is going through. But he remained faithful. Another point I mentioned, he outlived all the other apostles, and yet he remained faithful. Again, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us other than James, uh, but historical, uh, his, historical records would, you know, would teach that, that all but um, John were, were martyred for the faith. And, uh, you know, that he, he would be the last living. He'd remain faithful. That in of itself is more challenging um, than I think we might realize if we just mention it and, and move on. How many times have you heard someone say, or maybe, maybe you are saying this, that I've outlived everyone. I've outlived my family. I've outlived my friends. How many times have you heard someone say that? And they talk about how challenging it is when the, when, when the people that they know, the people that they spend a lifetime with are, no longer there. It's challenging. But he remained faithful. He remained faithful. I was talking to a friend of mine just a couple of weeks ago. Um, she, uh, her husband was a longtime elder in the church uh, and gospel preacher. Uh, a great friend of mine. Uh, I have a lot of books in my office and uh, other outlines that, uh, that came from him. And he passed last year. And uh, so I called her the other day and we talked for a little while, and uh, she made this, this comment. She said, I had, his, his name was Neil Myers. She said, I had ten siblings, and Neil had three. Neil, our siblings, and their spouses have all passed on. She said, I'm the last one. And, and she just, she couldn't describe what it was like for her. You know, here she is, the last one out of all of them. And so I think that's something to think about when you think about John uh, outliving these others and, and being that last one, but yet remaining faithful. I've known people that um, when a spouse or other family pass, they just, they, they just quit church. I mean, they've been in the church faithful in attendance for many, 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 many years. And then just, and just quit like it was nothing. It's not for me to make that judgment call on why they quit, but I've seen it. Maybe you've seen it. And here's a man that, that remained faithful, remained faithful uh, to God. One more, one more uh, point, and then we'll, uh, then we'll, did I make one last one? Okay, yeah. Last week we ended... In Revelation chapter 19 and chapter 22 by saying, you know, even though, you know, he, he was faithful, not to say that he didn't make mistakes. Uh, chapter 19 to verse 10, chapter 22, verses 8 and 9 where, is where he tries to worship the angel. And the angel says, um, see that you do not do that. You know, worship God. And um, Revelation chapter 1, again, we discussed this a little bit uh, a couple weeks ago. I'm sure there's some different opinions on Revelation, if this was actually the Apostle John or not, who wrote it, uh, you know, some are going to say it's not. Just as many other books uh, in the Bible, people are going to try to credit to someone else. Um, but, um, uh, but, you know, I, I certainly believe it was John that wrote it. And a lot of your, you know, your, your, when the rise you have closely after the first century and the second century 
would give him credit with it as well. Let me mention this real quick. I'll be right with you. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was an island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. and was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. So even in this persecution, um, very likely at, at, at near the end of his life and, and an older age, perhaps he's in his 80s at this time, very likely that he's in his 80s at this time, he's still faithful to God going through this. Mm-hmm. Question. Very good question, J.D. asked. Uh, you know, when you know the, the previous comment of people, you know, leaving the church when a, when a loved one passes, is that does that idolize that person? Again, I, every situation is different. All the circumstances are different, and you cannot speak one person for another. Um, but I, I do think it's important. I talked a little bit about this last week in, in the Sunday morning sermon. I think it's important, you know, that in all of our relationships, uh, uh, husband and wife, parents, children, whatever it might be that God is the, the focus, the foundation of it. And um, sure, I mean, I've not went through what many people have went through. Obviously, I've not lost a, a spouse or a child or parents, you know. So I, I can't speak from experience where some of you can. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is important that God is the foundation of, of everything that you do in life. And um, I can only imagine how more difficult it can be when you don't have that one there that you spend a lifetime with um, but you know hopefully you've, you've built something based on God that would help you to continue on uh, you know that would, that would help you to continue on to be to be faithful and, and, and give you enough uh, uh, encouragement and maybe even more of a drive to say I have more reasons to go you know one more reason to go to heaven and um, again you know I, I I realize everyone handles tragedy differently, and uh, and so, uh, but we, we we must continue to build our faith in God through that all. Any other thoughts or comments before we wrap up the Apostle John? Okay, very good. Well, uh, we will now begin with Philip, and again the. Uh, the handout is uh, on the tables out front. Uh, if you did not get one, you're welcome to do so. And we'll begin with Philip. We have about 15 minutes. Uh, the, you'll notice the handouts are probably going to start getting shorter and shorter. <laughs> I don't know. I've not worked far enough ahead, but there might come a time where we're studying a couple of apostles at once because there's just not as much information in some of these apostles as there are the first four. Now with Philip, we still have uh, we still have a, a, um, some information about him, um, but uh, you'll, certainly it's not as much as what we saw with Peter and Andrew and James and John. Um, so uh, I gave you a, a verse there, John chapter one and verse forty-three. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, "Follow me." So well, that's kind of our theme for our for our study of Philip. We'll get into that uh, more as we move along. But uh, with Philip, we begin the second group of apostles. Remember, we said these 12 apostles, the ones that our Lord selected. We're not talking about Matthias and Paul. We're talking about the ones that our Lord selected. Um, You read this list four times in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. Remember, Luke wrote the book of Acts. So John does not give us a list of the apostles. He tells us in John chapter 1 about some of them. But uh, he does not give us a list of the apostles. But in the four uh, accounts where the apostles are listed together, Philip always leads the second group of the four. So Peter always leads the first group, and then there's some changes with the other three and how they're listed after him. Philip always leads the second group of four. And, um, and it's pretty much the same except for one change, I think. Um, so now we're, we're looking at that second group of four apostles, beginning with Philip. Philip, the apostle, notice letter C under the introduction, Philip the apostle is not 
the same person as Philip the Evangelist that we read about in the book of Acts. So you remember when there's a problem in the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 6, some of the, uh, the, the widows, uh, some of the people feel that their widows are being neglected and they select these seven men to help. And um, the two that's most common to us are Stephen because we have his sermon in Acts 7 followed by his death and then Philip because we have his work in Acts chapter 8 in Samaria and then with the eunuch. Uh, in Acts chapter 21 in verse 8, he's called Philip the Evangelist. Uh, that's not to say that uh, Philip the Apostle was not an evangelist. Certainly he was. But the Philip that we're talking about in our study of the Apostles, this Philip is not the same Philip that we read about in, in the book of Acts. Okay? And that, was, uh, that, that, that Philip was not an Apostle. Okay? So uh, Philip's personal life, Philip uh, is a Greek name that means lover of horses. Uh, according to the uh, Dixon New Analytical Study Bible, and I read that a few other places as well, but uh, a Greek name that means lover of horses. Or, did, did you know that, Philip? Are you a lover of horses? Did you know that? <laughs> Love them from afar, yeah, absolutely. We have a Philip Hammond with us, so uh, you know, that's kind of me as, as well. Love them from afar. But... Um, Greek-speaking Jews... What was that? Did you have something else? Oh, okay. So, uh, so we see that he has a Greek name, and that's the only name that he's given in the, um, in the Bible. We don't read of another name of, of Philip. You know, like with Peter, you read of Simon, Peter, and Cephas. <laughs> but with Philip, it's only Philip. Now, obviously, he had to be a Jew. All of our Lord's apostles uh, were Jews. And with Philip... Mm, Everything that we know of him, other than being selected as an apostle, comes from the book of John. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all they do is list him with the apostles and then tell us nothing else about him. So everything we know about Philip comes from the book of John. But remember that Greek-speaking Jews were known as Hellenists in the New King James translation or Grecians in the King James or Grecian Jews in the ASV. In Acts chapter 6, I just mentioned that. When Philip the Evangelist... Here we go with our names again, where Philip the Evangelist is selected to help with some of these widows who were being neglected. But uh, we learned that uh, it was the Hellenists who felt that they were being neglected. Now, well, these were Greek-speaking uh, Jews, so it wasn't uh, uncommon in Acts chapter 6. It's certainly uh, before the first Gentiles become Christians in Acts chapter 10. Go ahead and open your Bible to John chapter 1 if you will. John chapter 1. So in John chapter 1, remember that John um, is setting out to prove that Jesus uh, is the Christ. Uh, he goes to the eternal word in the first four verses. He goes back before the creation of the world. He brings in John the baptizer. He talks about John the baptizer. And uh, that verse that we've mentioned a number of times, verse 29, John has two of his disciples with him when he sees Jesus. And he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's when, beginning in verse 35, these two disciples see Jesus and begin following Jesus. Uh, we know one is Andrew. When you get down to verse 40, and uh, as we talked uh, in the previous weeks, yeah, it's, it's likely almost certain that the other would have been John. And then so Andrew in verse 40 uh, finds his brother Peter in verse 41. And then verse 43, we pick up with Philip. John chapter 1 and verse 43. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So we talked a little bit about um, Bethsaida when we talked about Andrew and Peter. Remember, this was their, their childhood home. It was on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, they were fishermen. Philip uh, very likely was a fisherman himself. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Peter and Andrew would later at some point move to Capernaum, which isn't too far from Bethsaida. It's still on the Sea of Galilee. And you can understand um, living there uh, on the sea as fishermen, um, and so Philip is from this same, same uh, area, uh, likely the same occupation, 
And what we're noticing when we, when we get into this is to see that, that it's likely that more than half of our Lord's apostles had known each other um, for a lifetime. Very possible that they could have known each other for a lifetime. So he is from the same home city as Andrew and Peter. As I mentioned just a moment ago, Bethsaida was located on the Sea of Galilee. It's possible that Philip, like Peter, Andrew, James, and John, was a fisherman. Go to John chapter 21. Look at John chapter 21. <clears throat> As you know, John chapter 21 is the last chapter in the book of John. And so, this is following the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Okay, you have the the betrayal in chapter 18, the scourge and the crucifixion in chapter 19, the resurrection in chapter 20. So our Lord has already been crucified and resurrected. In John chapter 21, beginning in verse 1, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that'd be James and John, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to him, I am going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. So we talked a little bit about this way back when we studied the life of Peter. And here's Peter saying, I'm going fishing. And, you know, I, I mentioned that. I always kind of saw this as one of Peter's low moments in faith. And perhaps it was, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was just a man who had through these events over the last few days and said, Look, I just, I need to go do what I know to do. I need to go clear my mind. And perhaps that's the case. But Peter, of course, is the leader and he says, um, I'm going fishing. In your notes, uh, I mentioned how Philip and Andrew are likely the two apostles not named in John chapter 21 and verse 2. He names Peter, he names Thomas, he names Nathaniel, he names James and John, but wouldn't it be better if John would just name these people. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't that be easier on us? Because we talked about that in our study of John. We found what, I don't know, I can't remember. It's, it's in your notes eight or nine times where he talks about the disciple whom Jesus loved and never named him. And, and is thinking, John, if you would just give us his name. But let's, let's follow this for a moment. And we'll see that it's, it's, it's very likely that these two apostles are Philip and Andrew. If that's the case in verse 2, if so, seven of the first eight apostles went fishing that night. Okay? So you have um, Peter and Andrew. If, if Andrew is one of the not named apostles, Peter and Andrew, James and John, that's the first four. And then you have, um, if Philip is the other one not named, you have Philip, Thomas, and Nathaniel. Or, uh, or Bartholomew. So, you know, this, this, this would kind of give you a lot of reason to believe that that's likely the case. Matthew is the only one missing and we know that he was a tax collector. So out of the first eight um, if these two unnamed disciples are Philip and Andrew, then that would leave only Matthew out of the first eight apostles. And uh, his, his profession was a tax collector. Matthew chapter 10 verses 2 and 3 teaches us this. We know that Peter, Andrew, James and John were all fishermen. It's possible that the other three disciples mentioned by John were fishermen also and that all seven were closely associated with one another. If you go back to John chapter 1 and verse 45, you'll see that after Jesus called Philip to follow him and we are told that Philip is from Bethsaida, Philip then goes and finds Nathaniel. So there's some kind of connection there to them. If so, seven of the twelve apostles were professional fishermen. I know that's a lot of what is possibly, probably, likely. Um, but it's something to think about. It's something to consider. Certainly we don't want to put words into the Bible that are not there. Um, but when you try to piece it together, it's certainly uh, within the realm of possibility um, that, um, that you're looking at seven of the twelve apostles, professional fishermen. And they went fishing with Peter that night. Um, so that's, again, either way, we know four of them were, you know, and, and we, see, we see here now three more who went with him that night. And, and again, I just go back to something that I keep saying is we have to get the, Im the biblical image of these men in our minds. You 
know, rather than these characters that have reached such great levels of sainthood, the way the world would want to tell us, that we can't reach. And, and when we, we have that before us, if you, if you have a, a goal that you can't reach, if you, if, if you have a finish line that you can't reach, if you have something that's so high, so far above you that you can't reach, then it's going to be easier to give up. We need to see these men for who they were and, and understand that we're a lot like them. We're a lot like them. In their faith and in their failures. I am at least. I can't speak for you, but I am at least. Um, one more thought, and then uh, we'll turn it over to questions as we wrap things up. Philip probably knew Peter and Andrew for many years. If you go back to John chapter 12, John chapter 12, verses uh, 20 through 22. So there's only, outside of the list of the apostles, there's only, um, there's only a couple of times that we read about Philip when he was told by Jesus to follow him. And here in John chapter 12, uh, we, we read about him and possibly, as we said, just said in John chapter 21, going fishing that night. But in John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Uh, then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. I can't remember who it was, but there was some gospel preacher from years gone by that um, would point out this was his favorite uh, verse in the Bible. Actually, that last little that last little phrase there, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Think about that. You, you, use that as your motivation going forward. We wish to see Jesus. Anyways, verse 22, Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. So we see uh, them, come, them approaching Philip. Perhaps I put in your note, maybe it's because, you know, we see Philip has a Greek name. Greeks approached him. Maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Possibility at least. But um, Philip, for whatever reason, did not take them directly to Jesus. He took them to Andrew. We already said that uh, he was from the same hometown as Peter and Andrew. So, you know, it's, it's very likely that uh, they would have known each other for many years, long before becoming apostles or even disciples of our Lord. And uh, you see their connection with one another from time to time. Well, I'm not going to open up a new one. We just have two or three minutes left, and I'm going to hold that uh, section uh, Philip, the disciple and apostle, to next week. Any thoughts or comments on Philip or anything that we've uh, we've discussed uh, this morning? Someone, someone taught you that with no thoughts or comments, you get a longer break. All right. Hey, thank you so much. The bell's going to ring in just a minute or two. I saw Shane get up and walk out. So, thank you so much for being here, and we'll pick up with Philip uh, next week.